in our study of the life divine we are at a crucial point of the description of evolution earlier in the chapter titled man and the evolution sri aurobindo took up in great detail the various oppositions to the idea of evolution and then answered each of them in a manner so convincing that we have to recognize that evolution does exist does take place but that it has a superficial appearance in which the evolutionary part is not obviously seen we see only types specialized developing in complexity in subtlety in some kind of perfecting of their own type staying within the type but if you go one step behind we discover that there is an energy and an hidden consciousness in the energy which is able to modify the processes on the surface and we go a step further behind and we discover there is a consciousness that is intentionally supporting this whole play hiding behind the screen but working through the screen and it is able not only to modify those processes but enormously accelerate with a very precise focus whatever changes it wishes to make which makes possible that there can be a rapid transition from one type to another and then again a stabilizing within that type so the primary drivers of the evolutionary change involving first an increasing complexity and sophistication but second involving a change from type to greater type the primary driver is hidden behind deep within us is that divine presence which is the primary driver it uses the means on the surface and can influence them as necessary but the there are two layers one layer in which you see an unconscious energy and the consciousness is secret and this unconscious energy drives things and behind that is the overt consciousness hidden now which works through these i have given earlier examples which would be useful to appreciate how this works where we see the balance in nature from between different kinds of species let's say in the forest the balance between the tiger and the deer between the deer and the grass between the grass and the trees if there are too many trees covering there is not enough sunlight for the grass and what maintains the precise balance if the grass is not enough there is not enough deer if there is too much tiger the deer dies out before it can grow if there is too much deer it eats up too much grass and then there's no chance for the trees to grow if you look at the interdependence of the system which is in the forest any one of them overdoing will easily unbalance the whole thing and there is no obvious mechanism for maintaining balance and yet the balance not only grows it becomes more and more complex more and more sophisticated more and more interdependent and so it seems as if some kind of an intelligence works through all the fundamental processes in each species to maintain for the balance when the human being comes of course the change is too rapid for the unconscious energy to correct for the balance so we see devastation we see a forest reduced to barren land but then you wait a few decades and you find quickly the shrubs spreading into the barren land thorny shrubs which prevent the goat and other creatures from eating and they build the base in which moisture can be held in the ground for the more fine and subtle and sensitive grass to grow eventually which may take another 100 years or so but it will catch up eventually nature will bring back so there is obviously an intelligence that's that knows what has to be balanced out but you do not see the intelligence it seems to be a mechanical energy with the consciousness secret 
another example which I have used before, which uh, demonstrates this, in the human environment of a city, we have of course invaded the space of the forest and the animals, they have to adapt to us. So the cats have adapted, the dogs have become friends, but the play of the balance of the species is still precarious, constantly intruded by human beings. And we see something quite fascinating. There are studies which show that the average population of dogs in a town is pretty much constant. Even though human beings step in every now and then, catch dogs, cull them, sophisticated way of saying kill them, they cull them, they remove the dogs from the streets, but suddenly the dog population increases and then it stabilizes. Now the study shows that when there are enough dogs, then the dogs give birth to a litter of one or two. When you cull the dogs, you take them out, suddenly there are not enough dogs, then the surviving dogs give birth to a litter of five or six. And very quickly the dog population is replenished and when it reaches a certain saturation level, again the fertility drops. Now the dog mother is not thinking how many children should I have for the current distribution of population. Who is deciding that? Something that knows the current population in the entire city space. It cannot be an individual intelligence, it's part of at best a collective intelligence of the dog species or perhaps even beyond the dog species that has the balance across species in the intersection of all species. The intelligence is able to operate across different species, so it must be pervading all of them. And yet it has the ability to correct for the dog population by intervening at the cellular level of functioning to boost the fertility of a dog or reduce it at will. In a given space, in one town the fertility boosts up, in another town it drops. So it's not acting on the entire species, it acts in a local space. What is this energy? What is this intelligence? We cannot see it. And this is that Sri Aurobindo describes as an unconscious energy and a secret intelligence. But that intelligence is far more than the individual intelligence in terms of its capacity of intelligence. Behind that though is the true spirit that has the ability to work through this and modify. Now all this was part of that earlier background and last time we saw in the process of transition from the, let's say, ape to the human, which Sri Aurobindo is now primarily concerned with, how did the human being emerge? Sri Aurobindo takes two paths. One is the path that says, out of the earlier species there is an emergence, and the other path that says somehow the mind entered and created its own form. And we saw how taking the fine variations of each like a lawyer, Sri Aurobindo brings us closer and closer until we realize the two are interdependent. Even if there is an intelligence, a mind that steps in, able to create its own form, there has to be some physical basis that is plastic enough that it can take to shape, which means a prior evolution of some kind. Even if from the species evolution, from the ape, there is a complex development making it possible, the kind of mentality that the human being has requires a certain wide working of intelligence and mind that this cannot create of its own. And it is as if a prior formed individuality must have been present which then joins with this. Sri Aurobindo comes then to the conclusion that both movements are required. One part of an earlier evolution coming up, building the base which is sophisticated enough and on another part the formed mind already entering, trying to seize upon this material and joining. In the passage that we studied last time, at each step we saw the application of that idea to the current evolutionary transition from the human to the suprahuman. And in particular, we saw how Sri Aurobindo describes the mind coming into its own in the evolutionary process. And he describes it in this way that the necessary condition for the change from normal animal 
to human character of existence would be first development of the physical organization which would capacitate a rapid progression so a change first which makes the the physical change which makes possible that rapid transition what in us is required to be changed so that this growth could happen quickly we saw it in the context of the ape but now we have to see in the context of the human being what do we have to do and then he says second a reversal or turning over of the consciousness where the mind stepping out from its own emergent mind to self aware mind not only stays sitting on top as another layer but turns upon the lower layer stands up looks down and this is extremely important the same way in us as the higher faculties of consciousness emerge it's not enough that they rise out of the mind they have to turn upon mind separating themselves looking down this suggests immediately a form of practice shri rubindo you will recall when we mentioned this perhaps last time when he discusses the emergence of or the development of the intuitive consciousness the first requirement he says is to be able to silence your mind at will and hold it as long as needed second requirement he says is to shift the center of thought above head no more inside the brain but above the brain and straight away this description links with that to suggest as the higher grade of awareness begins to develop it turns down upon the lower working of its intellect and mentality looking down in separation even in opposition and this is a necessary part of its extrication into its full freedom so a reversal or turnover of the consciousness the same phrase the mother uses in a different context in an inward shift of consciousness as we awaken to the psychic presence within us as distinct from the surface desire ego center of the personality there is a reversal of consciousness we are no more outside looking in to something which is there something divine perhaps we are inside looking outward to what is now an instrumental personality we are not it but it is our instrument to reach out and engage with the world so there is a reversal both inward as well as upward in the spiritual growth and then the third step a reaching to a new height and a looking down from it at the lower stages now when it turns in this way it acquires it comes into its own and can grow as its own power reaching to its own height but then there is a this turning down to engage with the lower in terms of the higher to recast the lower as an effective instrument for the higher and then the fourth a heightening and widening of capacity which would enable the being to take up the old animal faculties with a larger and more plastic a human intelligence and at the same time or later to develop greater and subtler powers proper to the new type of being so this i'm in the fifth stage in the fourth stage the turning down to seize upon the lower to make it effective but with it a widening and heightening of what is taken up from below so this happened for us as the emergent mind turned down looked upon the lower instinctive mind of the animal nature in us and lifted it up and a similar thing will happen with the intuitive consciousness turning down on the thinking mind and intelligence and taking it up widening plastifying broadening deepening even integrating with the deeper dimensions of the inner mind which you will recall was part of the requirement for us to be able to have continuity of consciousness across lives you will recall that discussion one chapter before and so all these things you will find coalesce around this transition in the new step in evolution but once that fourth stage is done the free working of the mind now can develop its true powers freely in the same way for us in the higher grade of the intuitive or higher ranges of consciousness those powers would now develop freely with the full integration made 
with the lower intellect and other layers of mind. Now, even though we are looking towards the future, we have to recognize that many elements of this past transition which he speaks of, and especially level 3, 4 and 5, are not fully developed in us, even in the current humanity, in ma large parts of humanity. And much of that is the responsibility of our education. In the old days, the value given to education was, especially where a spiritual culture was concerned, was precisely to pull you out of your animality, come into your civilizational values, culturing of the human character and human nature and so on. All the impulses which are still of an animal kind are refined and taken up and given new values by the intellect, which now is the prime driver and our first identity. In the current mode of education, the idea is there that we have to somehow help improve humanity to take it up to its highest possibility. The idea is there originally. But in the current focus of education, this is completely forgotten. Rather, it has become a system for getting into your exams, getting into your job, and often in the educational system itself, pointing to your most crude and coarse instincts as your prime drivers of identity and your purpose of life. So that element which was earlier so important, going back barely 30 or 40 years ago, it was still considered important, has rapidly declined. And a kind of a indulgence and uh, a self-satisfaction in the participation of instinctive urges has been considered hedonic lifestyle, has been considered almost as the ideal. And this is an unfortunate decline in the evolutionary possibility. It must be corrected. And so the point I'm making, although Sri Aurobindo describes this as stages already to have been accomplished in the transition to the from the animal to the human, these things are not fully completed yet. We are still largely, in most of humanity, we are still largely half animal and half human. And there has to be an effort, including all those of us who aspire for a spiritual transition. There has to be some effort to take up these parts and bring them into their full human integration or human awakening. So this reversal or turning down of the consciousness is equally relevant for us in our mentalization as it will be relevant for the higher spiritualization. And equally the reaching to a new height and looking down from it at the lower stages is necessary equally in our mental terms even as we work on higher spiritual terms. And so if we have a good education which is spiritually oriented, it would take into account all these things. Make these the primary objectives in the education itself preparing for a supra-humanity. This was mother's goal in the way she formulated the educational system in the ashram school. It was one of the statements she made, which was written on the notebooks, on the front cover itself, of every notebook printed by the ashram for every child. And it goes something like this. The children should be helped to develop into straightforward, frank, upright, honorable human beings ready to develop into divine nature. The children should be helped to develop. Now whose job is it to help? Well, the adults who are supposedly already there reasonably, except they are not. So we're all in it together. Straightforward, frank, upright, honorable. If you see the stages of progression in these four words, but all of this to what goal? Ready to develop into divine nature. It's not even that we're expecting them to develop into divine nature, but we should be able to bring them to that poise where they're ready for it. If and when the soul within chooses or the evolutionary impulse pushes, we are ready for it. If these four conditions are not fulfilled, that readiness would be flawed. 
you can have all the most beautiful deep aspirations and ideas and ideals but you're not straightforward you're not uh, frank upright or honorable then you find yourself fighting your animal instincts even before you can access the spiritual possibilities your human part is struggling with the animal still before it can move to something higher well with that background we as a recapitulation we come to the last part of the portion that we read which sri rubindra joins these two movements of the ascending and the descending and brings them together <coughs> and again we will study this uh, a little more deeply for its further nuances <coughs> it's a part we had already read last time <coughs> it is more conceivable he says in the joining in the emergence from below and the descent from above it is more conceivable that there was an opening of some existing body to a supra physical influx so that it was transformed into a new body but no such event can lightly be assumed to have taken place in the past of material nature in order to happen it would seem to need either the conscious intervention of an invisible mental being to form the body he intended to inhabit or else a previous development of a mental being in matter itself who would be already able to receive a supra physical power and impose it on the rigid and narrow formulas of his physical existence now i'm looking at this once again because we review this from the perspective of our current effort in spiritual development first requirement was this an opening of some existing body to a supra physical influx in order to become the new body what does it mean today if there is a supra physical influx today of the supra mental consciousness or what mother has uh, described as sur homme in french which is translated as over over man the translation is irrelevant an intermediate consciousness which is the immediate next step the mind of light as sri aurobind formulated it or simply the intuitive consciousness as our first accessible base if this is formulating itself and attempting to settle in the human being it means already there is an opening of some existing body to a supra physical influx where on earth will you find this and interestingly one of mother's observations was that often she saw flowers were better as a vehicle to transmit the spiritual or psychic consciousness they were more receptive and then human beings obviously and so she used the flowers as a vehicle for transmitting that consciousness she gave you the flower you held it and then she again commented in some people they hold the flower and within a few minutes it has faded in others it remains blooming for a long time and it was often observed somebody would receive the flower and somehow it would fall to the ground he has held it and yet it slips out or they lose it or they drop it somewhere and it was always seen as symbolic of a lack of receptivity you've just received the flower that the mother has placed in your hand you've taken it and it drops out of your hand or you come down and you slip or lose it lack of receptivity because the flower itself was not an ordinary flower it was not given ordinarily you were holding a power a charge of a consciousness and inability to hold so the problem today is how many such bases of human consciousness are there which are ready to receive which have an opening to this supra physical influx when the supra mental manifestation took place in 1956 mother's observation was this downpour that took place for which the work had been going on for so long and she expected when she opened her eyes that everybody would be lying flat from this extraordinary influx of the supra mental consciousness and force and all that and she said she was surprised to see people getting up rolling their mats not realizing something so extraordinary had happened but then she commented there were four people on earth who were able to recognize that something unusual had happened now what a statement she is making how does she know four people on earth and they're not in her immediate environment and one of them she said was in africa 
How does she know this? Because in her body, universalized consciousness, her individual personality embracing the whole physical earth because she was working for the earth to lift humanity itself. Every human being was as if a part of her consciousness or a focal point in her consciousness. And everything she received or worked in herself, she was imprinting through that identity into the whole of humanity. And so when this event took place, she was also conscious, ah, there were four centers. And oh, this one is, oh, it's in Africa. And that's it. And we have the description of the person who was in fact in Africa, who saw this sunset and this beautiful golden uh, light that's spread. And, years, uh, and a month later, he got this message from Pondicherry, which said, oh, this is, this is the... Or two months later, he got the message about the event. And uh, later, of course, mother confirmed he was the person. He lived here for many years. He settled in the ashram. Indu Bhai Patel, I believe his name. How many were there who were conscious enough? And mother said, precisely because the work has not been done to make yourself conscious to the supramental. If there is not something within you which resonates with that vibration, when it settles, what will it touch? We can use the analogy of the radio. If you do not have the tuning coil which resonates at the frequency, how will it catch the frequency or the influence? And so the question for us is this. Which part of us resonates most deeply or most directly or most purely to the next higher step of evolution of the supra, supra mental consciousness. And obviously the only part in us which is most capable is the psychic being within. Parts of the mind sufficiently purified and opened, opened to the character of the super mind, which means they must become vast, full of light, full of uh, the influx of a higher substance, those also could receive something. But we have to work to prepare for this receptivity. And this point is of the most immediate urgency for humanity today. In fact, for each one of us in our spiritual quest. It is not enough that we do our daily rituals, daily pujas, daily meditations. To what end? And we must consciously conceive of and aspire for this awakening, for this attunement, for this sensitivity and receptivity. If not to the supramental, which we do not know as such other than as an idea, to the mother. To the mother in her most complete form. It's not enough to look at this person of the physical body, or oh, this is the mother. If she comes to you outside, wider than the body, you won't recognize her because she's too large. It's like the ant meeting the toe of the elephant. It cannot know the elephant. It's too big for its sight, for its senses. If you fixated yourself on a limited form, this is the mother, then that's all you know. But when she comes to you in her vaster personality, in her cosmic personality, in her supramental personality, you cannot recognize her. And so there has been to be an effort of cultivating the relationship with the mother whose form we know as this, but who is the cosmic divine mother and the supramental shakti, and to turn towards her in that vaster, uh, deeper, oceanic aspect of hers and develop a relationship there. That would be perhaps the most immediate, the most direct way even for the heart and the mind to develop this receptivity. So the first point was the necessity of an opening of some existing body to a supraphysical influx. And this would be our immediate requirement. Then it would need the conscious intervention of an invisible mental being to form the body he intended to inhabit or else previous development of mental being in matter itself to be able to receive the supraphysical power. And so both are required. We saw last time what Sri Aurobindo um, speaks of, the two powers. The two powers, there are two powers that alone can effect in their conjunction the great and difficult thing which is the aim of our endeavor. 
a fixed and unfailing aspiration that calls from below and a supreme grace from above that answers. And all the rest is the conditions in which the grace will act or the requirement for us to build those conditions. And all that we, have, we can reread with that objective. But when he uses this very interesting phrase, These are the conditions of the light and truth, the sole conditions under which the highest force will descend. And then he explains why this is important, the highest force, not some intermediate force. And it is only the very highest supramental force descending from above and opening from below that can victoriously handle the physical nature and annihilate its difficulties. And so here is the key the highest supramental force descending from above, but from below what is opening, also the supramental from below opening. And so this is this double poise, some part from below emergent already preparing a mental base, and then from above the mental being reasonably organized, and then the two joining was the transition for the from the animal to the human and a similar process here from within our consciousness the opening of the supramental below and that means the hidden concealed secret supramental intelligence what we discussed discussed earlier as that concealed intelligence in the mechanical energy of nature hides behind it the overt intelligence which is ultimately supramental. And it is working even as if from behind, from behind the veil, from inside even the inconscient, secretly concealed behind there. That from below rising to open, and then from above the revealed supramental, descending, joining, bringing with it the formulation, and then the two meet. Now this is what you see described by Sri Aurobindo. And the same idea we have seen now in the past in an inferior functioning of the mental consciousness. The idea here also that an existing body influencing the lower, forming it to match its requirement. So in order for in order to happen, it would seem to need either the conscious intervention of an invisible mental being to form the body he intended to inhabit. And you will remember our discussions of how many of the biological organs and senses even have been formed in ways that we cannot explain unless there was some prior template acting upon it. And so the same idea here, a template molds. In practice, this takes a form which is quite fascinating. When a more developed soul chooses to enter the human body, it cannot just enter an existing body which is too dull or too limited for its full play. And so if it is developed enough, it will preside over the formation of the body from the fetus on. While it is still in the womb, it creates a link energetically and then infuses a little bit of its influence, not too much, otherwise it will destabilize a little bit of the influence. And as the fetus develops, it puts a little more of itself until the fetus formation as the cells grow has been influenced by the imprint that it has brought in forming the child's form. And as the child then takes birth, it's only a question of stages of transition, it is still continuing that. And often for a few weeks, it may continue the infusion. In some of the very extraordinary cases, even for a few years, the process continues until eventually the full seizing of the personality is completed and the child is able now to function with the, something of the revealed consciousness of the, which the soul has brought. We know, for example, in the case of one of the extraordinary geniuses of the last century, uh, who is known as Vasishtha Ganapati Muni, who was earlier the teacher and guru of uh, Kapali Shastriyar, who came here and met the mother and Sri Aurobindo also. He was the only person to whom the mother and Sri Aurobindo made an offer. They said, we are looking for somebody who will continue the work after us. And they found in him the suitable instrument. 
Now, such an extraordinary being, till the age of five, would not speak. He was functioning otherwise like a child, doing everything else but unable to speak. And it was because this infusion had not yet been completed. The body was still was developing. And what is interesting, you will see around the age of five is when the formation of the personality reaches a certain stage of completion that it can now assert itself in some sense of individuality. Almost all of us who have had some early spiritual awakening will recall an experience around that age where something suddenly opens up. And the mother you will find also describing how at the age of five she was conscious of this light which was above her head and she would wait for it to come down. But that's around the time it happens. So in his case it was at the age of five and at that time of course the means were different when he was not speaking. They took him to the Ayurvedic physician who said, well, we know what this is, you have to shock the system. And so they had a method to take a hot iron and brand certain parts of the body and the shock made the person come into his own fully and then he was able to speak and fully functional sentences normally. But anyway, there's a rationale behind it. Yes, it's not acceptable in today's uh, values, but still that was the rationale and it worked and it served a purpose. I'm giving these examples so you understand the importance of this infusion process. That it can happen as if the soul is infusing its influence on the formative fetus long before even the brain has developed into its capacity. But it is infusing and shaping it inside out from an early stage. A similar process is ongoing for us, at least for those of us who aspire for the new consciousness. We may not be conscious of it, but the fact that we aspire, there is an infusion that takes place from, that takes place from above, shaping from within. The sooner that can begin, of course, the easier it is. But we will shortly see in the very next paragraph today, that the human body is sufficiently plastic that even if we start late in physical terms, for the spiritual turn that is required, the body is plastic enough to receive this influence. Now, Mother used a phrasing which is unusual and you will understand it in this context now. She said there are many people who have come to the ashram not for doing the sadhana, but their souls are attracted to the presence here and their souls are in a preparatory stage to be in this atmosphere, to acclimatize to this consciousness in order to take up a life of sadhana in the next incarnation or maybe later even. Now just that idea, you will see what it means in this context. The soul is acclimatizing itself to this new consciousness and its power, coming under its influence, allowing something of its consciousness to be reshaped, remolded under that influence, an adaptation taking place for the soul because the body is going to be shed. The soul's adaptation necessary in its next life to take up a more concentrated effort. I would like to believe and I don't think it would be wrong to say that for those of us who are actively drawn to these to this aspiration, we have already been through that acclimatization phase in some kind. That's why it is of urgency for us in this lifetime. For others, it is not so much urgent. They are just happy to be in a special environment. But for those of us who feel the need for this, who feel the call, who feel that this, there's something important to be done, a part of that acclimatization has been done and even though today there is a concentrated effort, there is still an acclimatization process for other parts of our being, not the soul perhaps for the mind, for the vital, for the physical. And for that purpose, frequent, sustained contact with the presence is of great help. And we will understand it in this sense, the importance of it. And then he speaks of a pre-existent body so much evolved as to be fitted for the reception of a vast mental influx, capable of a pliable response to the descent into it of the mental being. A similar transition 
is to take place even in the human society today that in the human society as it is in a collective the collective consciousness rising up all the way not just intuitivizing but entering what sri aurobindo has described as the over mental consciousness would be the base upon which a supra mental being could descend and hold its own without reaction revolt from below and this was part of the objective in formation of the ashram and of aurovil so the collective aspect then becomes important to take it to that next level where sri aurobindo promised the mother that he would come as the first supra mental being descending from above born not in the human way but in this movement which she, she has dis- sri aurobindo has described here but before that can happen many stages born through the human way would be needed to lift all the way to an over mental collective receptive vessel so to say cradle in which that birth could take place and then this is where we ended last time when he says it is quite conceivable that such an evolution from below and such a descent from above cooperate in the appearance of humanity in earth nature the secret psychical entity already there in the animal might have itself called down the mental being the mind purusha into the realm of living matter in order to take up the vital mental energy already at work and lift it into a higher mentality and a similar process the psychic being within us calls down now the still higher consciousness and so now it was a kind of a recapitulation of the key principles or key ideas which we have to specially focus upon for their applicability in the immediate present and future work and we move now to the next paragraph what happens then when the human being emerges what happens then and the same idea he formulates in a very general way so we will also understand what happens as the new consciousness and its form emerges mother spoke of the possibility of several intermediate steps as did sri aurobindo so let's just take each of these intermediate steps to be uh, to have this applicability next it may be considered that each type or pattern of consciousness and being in the body once established has to be faithful to the law of being of that type to its own design and rule of nature so it's a general statement every type of creature that has emerged plants or animals as soon as that transition is made it settles into its type the crocodile being crocodile 64 million years ago has not evolved afterwards but has stayed within its type faithful to the type maybe developing more skills maybe if human beings interact more with crocodiles even developing a more complex kind of intelligence but within the type of the crocodile nature and so what is the mental nature of man the urge to organize to make perfect and this is the type of humanity of mental humanity of course the less than mental humanity has other objectives but the moment you come into mind and become the mind in human beings this becomes your priority what happens if you take a type higher up of the intuition the intuitive will have its own particular character and the over mental which will have its own character characteristic of that grade of consciousness for the intellect it is to organize and to make perfect whatever it is that it does so the intuition it will be a consciousness of knowledge but a knowledge which is experiential not mental which is what it knows and so to be able to hold and to move from experience to experience each time growing in experience in certain knowledge which is perfect within its limits and so the intuitive intuitive being will act very differently in the example we gave last time from the intuitive consciousness in a single word you can convey an entire paragraph because the intuition conveys a punch a bundle of experience straight 
now when you see the intuitive increasing in humanity what the what will be the form that it will take let's say you go to a dance program you've seen the dance which is sensationally stimulating that's for the animal human the dance which is aesthetically pleasing and harmonious is the dance for the mental mind for the mental being for the intuitive consciousness the dance will convey radiate project and experience and the audience watching the dance will go ah i have awakened to an experience of something which i didn't have before and you will see the masters of dance do this today they are there that's when we call them masters when they can do something where you forget it's a human being doing it you actually really think it's that deer which is prancing on the stage or this personage or that situation when the dancer with the or the theater artist is now in sorrow that sorrow is imprinted in you as an experience you share in it which you had never had before in your life or could never have and that nuance of it and having experienced it you say wow what an extraordinary performance a series of experiences projected in this way and eventually shifting increasingly more and more to a spiritual character of the experience that is what would be the nature of the intuitive dance performance or the music performance instrumental vocal whatever form it takes or theater even in cinema one could conceive of such an uplift taking place which conveys actually projects an experience in an intuitive way so and that's the power of the medium in a single word in a single experience a single gesture you get the whole thing a whole paragraph which would be presented through words and still it would be an idea and not an experience that you can get like this in every realm of human activity the increasing intuitivization would bring this character of sharing directly of experience but an experience which lifts above the intellectual understanding it is something so beautiful or at least so um, rich in complexity that you have no way to articulate words fail you can of course describe it but words fail to convey the full value of it when this becomes spiritual more and more spiritual then of course it will be a series of spiritual experiences and glimpses of the world of the spiritual reality that will be so conveyed in the overmental consciousness the same power will reach universality touch infinity it will be a vision of the universe from an angle from this perspective worlds which are experienced not tiny bundles of experience entire worlds rich worlds that you have access to which are created and projected a glimpse of this in a very limited way because whatever you will find in the overmental consciousness in its infinite status you will find re- reflected in what shirbind calls the higher mind in a finite level so a glimpse of this you experience in certain kinds of novels when you enter what are called uh, the word used is if the word slips so i might a, a, a novel in which you have as if an entire world which is presented and you are immersed in the world and for a while it's as if that world becomes as real or more real than this world and the result is a glimpse of some domain some reality somewhere of another realm of the vital mental or whatever planes in which you are able to live but through the mind it's not the experience of the overmental the overmental would have the character of the intuitive but now with that same uh, infinity now that you would actually experience it and live in it and be changed by that contact so a glimpse of this we have when we enter such experiences through uh, anyway the word slips my mind a harry potter series for example would be one such you get so immersed in it you enter a large text which is of the character of the ramayana you would get into a different world altogether and then afterwards that world lives with you in your physical experience of reality it's not left behind somewhere 
there are other novels the dune which was a science fiction series if any of you have read that or several such um so the idea you get the idea here that there is a possibility of glimpses of other worlds but here we are doing it through the mind in the novel there it would be a direct exposure and experience of it but it stays with you it changes you so each of these planes will have its own distinctive characteristics and with each of those will come faculties which are new which do not belong to the existing access of the intellect one such which we can never experience as long as you are in the mental consciousness is the touch of ananda which transcends dualities that you can experience something and the delight the rasa or the juice of it which is beyond the dualities in its pure status and this is only possible in a consciousness which is infinite which can embrace all and be above dualities it's not possible to consciousness which works in pieces like our mind the mind will always cut up and if because it has one piece it has another piece in contrast to it only the consciousness can embrace which can embrace all in a continuum which is infinite can experience the character of ananda and there are other such experiences which belong properly to each of these domains their proper powers and faculties truth consciousness is a phrase sri aurobindo uses often which you can understand as an idea in the mind but the experience of it something which is literally substance of truth form of truth material of truth is experienced starting with the intuition and above or deep within us when you touch the psychic being in its personality you have the glimpse of that and until we reach those domains we do not know what it's like or the word is makes sense but the experience of it slips the mind or we feel it just behind our understanding and so at each step now there will be powers which will awaken and all existing human activities would be taken up and rendered in terms of those powers so but it will be faithful to that type to its own design and rule of nature but what is the rule and design of nature as you go up we saw certain powers but still what is it characterizing it would be somewhat pointless to have the supramental being being another type only among many types something has to be distinctly more and here he gives you the clue but it may also very well be that part of the law of the human type is its impulse towards self exceeding that the means for a conscious transition has been provided for among the spiritual powers of man interesting idea that in the human type itself the purpose of the type is to exceed its own type and that's programmed into the design of the type now if this is the case then inevitably we will grow out of humanity into the higher grades and this vehicle is good enough to take us into those higher stages of consciousness you do not need a major physiological change to access those states but if this is the case for the human mentality what does it mean for those higher states their type is by definition more and more universal the overmental type is universal type meaning it is able to express everything the type itself now has exceeded the definition of type to become universal individual and in the supramental that is that reaches its fulfillment so in the design and the law of the human type is this impulse towards self exceeding and this is the reason why even as we reach some stage of success perfection a goal achievement we are dissatisfied while those who look to it as an achievement and a success will say oh you are so great you have achieved this you look at yourself and say but i don't feel any different this is no good i don't feel i have done something worthwhile and the dissatisfaction pushes you to something more so this problem of dissatisfaction which we have always blamed human beings for in contrast to animals who are satisfied with their type this problem is actually the promise for something much greater 
that the means for a conscious transition has been provided for among the spiritual powers of man. That it's not enough that we have spiritual powers, but even the capacity has been given to us which allows to make that conscious transition beyond the mental. That's been given to us in the very design of the human being. And this is something so extraordinary and so promising, therefore. You will recall Sri Aurobindo making a reference earlier and we touched upon it when he said that even in the Upanishads there is this idea that uh, there is, there are stages in development and the human being is as if the acme, the best, the highest. And Sri Aurobindo took pains to point to uh, that text. It is from the Aitiriya. And now here we will see the value of it in this context. And I read briefly from it. It's not a very long Upanishad and yet it is quite deep for the suggestions if you look beyond the obvious sense of the words. And in Sri Aurobindo's translation of the Aitiriya, uh, there is this, I'm reading from, from here, he, it describes how the characteristics of substance or tendency, ecological tendencies were first built into the universe and then individualized. And in the first appearance of the individualization, there is the attempt, the spirit who makes all this wants now to enter into and experience these things. So, he created these gods in their universal action. They fell into this great ocean and hunger and thirst leaped upon them. Then they said to him, command unto us a habitation that we may dwell secure and eat of our food. Now you have to see this for the, in the Sanskrit vocabulary, the sense of food. Annam is the physical material world, but it is also nourishment, the drawing of experience by which you grow. And so the gods say, we give us an individual body so that we can now participate in this evolutionary process and growth through experience. And the spirit then, he brought unto them the cow. Now it's not the physical being, again there's a double meaning. But they said, verily it's not sufficient for us. He brought unto them the horse and they said, verily it's not enough for us. Now the cow representing light or illumination, horse representing power, energy. He brought unto them man and they said, Oh, well fashioned truly, man indeed is well and beautifully made. Then the spirit said unto them, enter ye in each according to his habitation. And now all these gods, universal powers, they enter into different parts of the human body and take up their station and their function within. Why the human body is good? Because in it is the capacity to exceed itself and within it are the means by which the full spiritual awakening that the gods seek to return to their own home is possible. And it's not possible in those earlier stages. We're just consciousness, just energy. No, we need consciousness, we need energy and then we need this X factor which is of self-exceeding and spiritual possibility. And then the fire became speech and entered into the mouth, air became breath and entered into the nostrils, the sun became the sight and entered into the eyes and so on. We don't have to go into that. But after all that, the spirit, spirit looks at this form and says, how will I enter into it? This is the most interesting part. And then there's a whole long passage, one after another, of how the spirit says when it broods upon this possibility, he says, oh, if I enter through food, then I, I can be seized, we can seize the spirit by food. If I enter through speech, then the, by speech you can seize the spirit. If I enter through breath, by breath you can seize the spirit. None of those are good enough for the spirit to enter. So it will not enter by any of the existing powers of the cosmic working. Because then by that power you could see the spirit. Spirit must transcend all these. So by what means shall it enter? And it comes to this. The spirit thought, without me, how should all this be? And he thought, by what way shall I enter it? He thought also, if utterance is by speech, if breathing is by breath, if sight is by eye, if hearing is by ear, if thought is by mind, if the lower workings are by apana, 
who were then am I? I am not those things. It was this bound that he cleft. It was by this door that he entered in. And this is the entrance at the top of the head. The gap, the crack, the entry point. It is this that is called the gate of the cleaving. This is the door of his coming. And here is the place of his delight. And further on, three mansions and three dreams and all that stuff. We don't get into it further. But the idea here that already in the design of the human being, this first impulse is towards self-exceeding. It will always outgrow its own design specifications. And second, that the means for a conscious transition has been provided among the spiritual powers of man. So the self-exceeding, you do not need the spiritual powers. You have the mental is good enough for that. With the mental, you are actually able to look upon your body function and say, I am able to improve my body by going through this exercise, by taking this food, by intervening on my genetics, I can perfect my own body. Mind is good enough, you don't need spirit for that. But you need something more for the spiritual awakening, which mind is incapable of doing by itself. And that is that second factor. Both of these are there in us. Then he says, the possession of such a capacity may be a part of the plan on which the creative energy has built in, has built him. So the creative energy secret, or you can say from above, overt, has built it with that capacity as part of a plan. So there is a plan of which we are not fully conscious. This is very interesting statement Sri Aurobindo makes. And the human being is a transitional creature. Out of the unknown, we move to the unknown. It's a very Vedic phrase. You are emerging from the unconscious ocean, rising into the superconscious ocean, and in between is this mental mentality which bridges the two. And you emerge out of the unknown, you look back, you don't really know from where you've come. You look forward, you know you're going towards something, you don't really know what you're going towards, but you know you're going towards it. So there's a plan. We don't know the plan, but the creative energy which has embedded all these elements has already programmed that into us. It may be conceded that what man has up till now principally done is to act within the circle of his nature on a spiral of nature movement, sometimes descending, sometimes ascending. There has been no straight line of progress, no indisputable, fundamental or radical exceeding of his past nature. So he says, we can accept this for argument's sake. People will say this, that we have not really changed. You go back uh, 2000 years, the problems which they had then are still the problems we have today. They have not really changed. This is this very famous uh, text which is uh, quoted of times in the Greek tradition 2000 years ago. I don't remember the name of this Greek philosopher. He looks at the young people in their teenage and says, Oh, these young people, they are degenerating so fast. What is going to happen to human society if this degeneration continues? We'll look at any grandparent today. They say pretty much the same thing of the teenagers. And so you might say it's nothing has really changed. We are still going through the same issues, the same cycles. And so he says, yes, you can concede that as a first level. Then he'll show something more. That what we have done till now is to act within the circle of the human nature. It's a circle. There are limits, there are boundaries. But within those boundaries, you can do a lot. Maybe the circle is much bigger than the other animals. So big that you don't see its edge. But still there's a limit and you have not exceeded that limit really. And then he says, on a spiral of nature movement, meaning even in what seems to be growth or fall, it's a spiral. And maybe you're growing, but you're falling and growing and falling. Maybe you're growing a little more each time, but it's a spiral really. So the first sense of the spiral is a horizontal spiral. And then you tilt it slightly and every spiral step takes you slightly higher. But you have to fall in order to rise and fall again in order to rise and so on. The rationale of it Sri Aurobindo discusses elsewhere and we won't go into it now. There has been no straight line of progress. You do not see that. This continued. Always there's a break, always there's a fall, whether of civilization or of societies or of individuals. You don't see straight line except for brief 
periods no indisputable fundamental or radical exceeding of his past nature what has he done what he has done is to sharpen subtilize take a more and more complex and plastic use of his capacities so you've made more effective more poignant you can get down to tiny greater focus make more subtle and more complex and mix these make them more adaptable that's about all but always within the same circle it cannot truly be said that there has been no such thing as human progress since man's appearance or even in his recent ascertainable history so now shri bindu is countering he says you can't truly say there is no progress yes it looks like it but it's not truly so for for however great the ancients however supreme some of their achievements and creations however impressive their powers of spirituality or intellect or of character there has been in later developments an increasing subtlety complexity manifold development of knowledge and possibility in man's achievements and he describes all the fields which are touched so you you can look back and say they were so great and all the re- things he tells you what was so great about them achievements creations powers of spirituality intellect character you do not see today people of that type or that greatness commonly if at all occasionally but they are also occasional in the past you had people with extraordinary powers just of memory for example who could learn the whole entire mahabharata with whatever 100000 lines by heart some of them knowing it at the age of 15 or 20 how many do you find people like that today occasionally one or two and that is also exceptional what did you do what was your bringing you are surprised can i do it no way at least that's the idea we have so in their spirituality they were such great beings some of the rishis that they literally shook the universal order and upset the universal balance with their spiritual power where are they today so even that even then he says there has been increasing subtlety complexity manifold development of knowledge and possibilities of achievement meaning we will say technology in today's vocabulary in his politics society life science metaphysics knowledge of all kinds art literature even in his spiritual endeavor in all these fields we have done things which were not possible then even in his spiritual endeavor less surprisingly lofty and less massive in power of spirituality than that of the ancients there has been this increasing subtlety plasticity sounding of depths extension of seeking so you don't see the same dramatic character of the old spirituality but something has happened subtlety has increased plasticity this earlier you were stuck in a path today you straddle many paths because you realize there are different parts in you which have different let's say processes of growth and almost as if unless this subtlety and plasticity had evolved enough the integral yoga was not possible to be given to humanity it's a very interesting idea Sri Aurobindo's appearance would have been premature his message and the practice of the integral yoga would have been premature if there was not this subtlety already developed so subtlety complexity plasticity sounding of depth extension of seeking going beyond boundaries in the spirituality there have been falls from a high type of culture a sharp temporary descent into a certain obscurantism cessation of the spiritual urge plunges into a barbaric natural materialism all this is what we see and if it would be worthwhile to go into each of these phrases and look at all those examples maybe we will keep for next time or we can skip but all of these are extremely important if you can recognize what these are in today's society then you can counter it as long as you believe everything is hunky dory we will be fine just wait a little longer it will happen automatically you are missing the point and you things will only get worse we should be able to recognize go to the core of what those causes are and then begin the correction 
and this is extremely important today so there have been falls and so on descent and then the barbaric materialism but these are temporary phenomena at worst a downward curve of the spiral of progress this progress has not indeed carried the race beyond itself into a self exceeding a transformation of the mental being so that has not yet happened within the human we have reached whatever subtlety and plasticity we have not yet crossed that boundary though but that was not to be expected for the action of an evolutionary nature in a type of being and consciousness is first to develop the type to its utmost capacity by just such a subtilization and increasing complexity till it is ready for her bursting of the shell so this is the interesting point yes we have not crossed that human boundary and there's a reason for it so you saw how he goes he started with that acceptance which was a very negative view that we are caught in the boundary of our human type yes it looks like that but you see something has gone much more he says then he says we have not yet crossed that boundary and he justifies why because it is nature's process to make perfect within the boundary first make what perfect precisely take this type to the edge of perfection which will make it ready for the next leap and what is required there and again we have to look at ourselves today what are we doing for this to develop the type to its utmost capacity by just such a subtilization and increasing complexity till it is ready for her bursting of the shell and this is the work we should be doing in our self education and culturing in everything in life subtilization make yourself more and more subtle and at the same time increasing in complexity and plasticity until literally you exceed the type boundary of the type and cross over into the next now you'll recall in our description of the intuitive mind training first silencing mind second shifting the center of uh, thought third was waiting for the initiation from the intuition to begin and the fourth was developing all the faculties of the mind to their highest most subtle most plastic until they practically reach the boundary and the limit of their capacity and begin to exceed themselves into the next level of consciousness that's the fourth method of intuitivization of the mind and if you've done the first three this will happen and it doesn't happen to everybody it is it requires already in the mind a certain development of refinement and uh, plasticity but once taken up and especially when taken up by the yoga force it can happen very rapidly and develop within a few years what would otherwise take centuries or many lifetimes of progress and our mind is potentially capable of this and the beans for it will be co- the conscious influx of the higher light into the mind building in it its powers so until it is ready for her bursting of the shell now you can wait for nature's bursting or in the individual sadhana we actually take it to the point of bursting by conscious personal aspiration and the assistance of the grace and then he describes this bursting of the shell the ripened decisive emergence when it is completely ripe then it is decisive there's no relapse if you make a premature burst you fall back and there is an oscillation the ripened decisive emergence reversal you come into the new consciousness emerge into it but then the reversal of consciousness turning over of consciousness on itself that constitutes a new stage in the evolution now you see that portion we reread from last time about this turning looking down from above and then consolidating the higher powers this is what happens again if it be supposed that her next step is the spiritual and supramental being the stress of spirituality in the race may be taken as a sign that that is nature's intention so if the next step of evolution was to be towards spiritual obviously she'll start preparing that also 
and if you see the stress of spirituality in the race it's a sign that nature is preparing for that i will bring next time a passage from the mother where she says something like this now nature is preparing for one of those great transitions where she feels the urge for a new step in evolution and once nature decides that it's like nature modulating the fertility of the dogs well she's now modulating the thought powers in the human being and the spiritual impulse in the human being with the same ease and suddenly everywhere on earth people say oh but i am finding life so dissatisfying there has to be something more where is this something more and they start looking who decided that they didn't decide it was nature in them pushing nudging turning except because their mind is so confused they don't know what it is that the urge is for so you find a restlessness dissatisfaction and then an attempt to satisfy by means which were inferior and either as a result a destructive curve a fall or a quick exhaustion which then turns to something higher that says ah but if all this fails there must be something to that yoga thing which people talk about let me try it he saw a very interesting passage in the us in the late 60s with the flower children and the hippie movement there was this kind of an upward turn to a spiritual ideal but then very quick degeneration through drugs and uh, free sex and all kinds of uh, weird ideas of breaking um, the boundaries of societal restriction for what for lapsing back into animal instincts and that's the form it took and then a few who were saved by the appearance of some spiritual influence it was at that time that also from india there were a large number of teachers who went to the west and those who could catch that wave turned to something spiritual others fell sometimes in irreversible damage others recovered soon enough that something was opened but they never really found their way again but what is interesting is 20 years then these were the leaders of society and of even of industry uh, you would be familiar that somebody like steve jobs was in fact living like a hermit he had deep spiritual roots which came from his days of drugs but uh, having crossed that passage it was still a bit mixed he tuned into higher possibility operating through the mind but the possibilities was limited to what the mind could access and it was uh, he lived in a kind of a spartan we would use the word uh, the tradition of the japanese tradition you know the, the zen tradition he was a strong influence buddhism was a strong influence but it was a kind of a austere noble but austere idealistic turn it stopped there it did not enter the spiritual proper because perhaps the damage from the drugs because he saw the futility of that access and could not conceive of some higher possibility spirituality was there but through this window and limited to this window and many such but they were then those who turned the direction of life and had a great impact on society so this urge of the spiritual is a sign of this preparation and the sign too of the capacity of man to operate in himself or aid her to operate the transition that this awakening spirituality is taking place it means we have also within us the capacity to directly seize upon the evolutionary process or assist nature's push and the two can join our individual effort and the impulse of nature can work in collaboration and this is going to be extremely important in the present transition if the appearance in animal being of a type similar in some respect to the ape kind but already from the beginning endowed with the elements of humanity was the method of human evolution the appearance of the human being of spiritual type resembling mental animal humanity but already with a stamp of the spiritual aspiration on it would be the obvious method of nature for the evolutionary production of the spiritual and supramental being 
So again, he looks at that transition and compares with this transition. What was the way she did? Ape kind, there was a type similar to ape kind in some respect, but need not have been exactly the ape. And from the beginning endowed with elements of humanity. And that was the means for the human evolution. Today we find, even though we have not found the link from ape to human, we found 10 different types at least of human variants, which are all now extinct. Denovisin man or is one of those uh, and various others, including some dwarf types uh, recognized in, uh, from their bones. They were a different species of human types, at least 10, many more perhaps, but they were all of this type which had a human potential and so from there the rapid change could be made. In the same way, he says, the appearance in, in the human being of a spiritual type would be the way by which the spiritual evolution would rise from the human. But what is this? Spiritual type resembling mental animal humanity but already with the stamp of the spiritual aspiration on it. That would be the obvious method. So do we see this around us? And I would even suggest, are we part of that? And if we are part of that, then obviously that's your promise that the transition will be made. If nature could help to create this, and if we are that spiritual type resembling mental animal humanity, what does that mean? You know you are not this mental animal humanity and yet you are sitting in a body and a mind which is mental animal humanity. But somewhere deep inside you feel, I'm not this really. I don't belong to this type. I deserve to be. I am fundamentally something different. Unfortunately, again there are forces which try to distract from a higher truth. So you have literature out there in the New Age literature which will say, ah, if you don't feel you're human, you belong some place to a higher grade, then you are coming from some other planet. You are an extraterrestrial which has taken birth in humanity. Nope, that's not it. You are in consciousness. The soul now recognizes it belongs to a higher plane. It remembers its home. It has now taken a human body, but in the body infused sufficiently of its higher influence and sufficiently enough to awaken that spiritual touch. And you would recognize this because you will see from a pretty early childhood, you will recognize you did not fit in somehow. The whole family was somehow oriented that way, but you had something which was different and you struggled to try to fit in, but you could not, you did not match. And it took you time to recognize that this was actually a strength and not a weakness. And if you recognize something of that, in however tiny bit, you know that you were not part of that and you are meant for a different life. And if this is so, you would also have had at some point in your life a touch of the spiritual experience in whatever way it came. Sometimes it may be as simple, I am walking in the forest and suddenly I began to feel as if I was one with the forest and I didn't know where I was as a body. Brief experience and then it passed and then I said, oh, what happened? or in dream state you had some experience or whatever form it was, some touch briefly which was part of this spiritual type resembling mental animal humanity but the spiritual influence putting its touch there and saying, ah, don't get stuck in that. And this would be the obvious method of nature for the evolutionary production of the spiritual and supramental being. And if this is there within you as the deep aspiration, that is also nature's intention within you, that is also your soul's intention within you. And the two aligning and the divine grace supporting, there is nothing which is impossible. It is certain the transition will take place, it will be decisive, it is only a question of time and process in between. And that depends on the way we put ourselves into the process, the way we relate to the grace, the way we, the effort that we make and the receptivity that we build. So I think we will pause here. Looking back at the passage we have covered, the important characteristics that we have to keep in mind 
that within us already the power of self exceeding is present as well as the spirit the conscious power of spiritual transition is present the part in us in which it is most obviously held is in the deepest presence of the soul the psychic being and that's why to become conscious of that or at least to allow its influence to fill our thoughts and emotions and actions more and more to let that influence lead more and more will be the way by which we can accelerate the self exceeding and the awakening to the spiritual parallelly with that would be the active aspiration for the higher levels of consciousness the divine being that is forming or awaiting which will fuse and assist this transition which for us directly is the mother herself as the divine shakti as the supramental maha shakti and it is her consciousness entering us forming itself in us shaping us from within which is the means of the accelerated evolution into the spiritual being and so the second movement is the upward opening to her and the descent of her powers into us and their forming and developing not unlike the description we read from the aetherio upanishad of the gods rushing in now it is no more the gods it is the divine shakti the mother of the gods who works in us who fills even the gods and their limited working and amplifies and liberates from their limitation who awakens us and leads the evolutionary change so someone asked the mother mother how can we become supramental and she says oh try it will be fun to see how you can do it you cannot just as the monkey cannot think itself into humanity what you can do is to open to the supramental consciousness and allow it to work in you and lift you into its consciousness and so that is the way of uh, the primary method of which sri aurobindo articulates in the very text which we read in part he puts it like this that first you must have the aspiration which is what turns you and builds the link and creates the receptive base second there has to be the element of rejection of everything that is contrary to that aspiration and to the new consciousness a large part of it is the impulses that come from our still mental animal humanity and so lifting all of those powers or those functions into their higher working at the very least mentalizing them and joining them with the aspiration and then the third is the conscious surrender later he puts also the criteria for the transformation is consciousness plasticity surrender the more you become conscious the more you become plastic to the touch the more you are able to surrender and allow the action to take place in you and equally the more the surrender takes place the more the consciousness and plasticity grow and that's the means of the actual transformatory process of which aspiration rejection and surrender are the first base so taking it to very essential principles you see how the text sri aurobindo has which superficially is describing this evolutionary process to the human being but is also describing the principles behind which are operative in the transition from the human to the suprahuman and the conviction that it should give us from this last passage that there is such a thing as this spiritual type resembling mental animal humanity but already with the stamp of the spiritual aspiration on it and this is the obvious method of nature for the evolutionary production of the spiritual being and the supramental being we can uh, meditate on this for a while and we'll continue the passage next sunday